All right, hey, what's up, viewers of YouTube? It's Tyler here of Chico Crypto, and I'm here with Jimmy Lipham, uh, actually a developer. He has some knowledge about the things that I don't. I, you know, I'm just an <laughs> investor. You know, I do research, but I don't know anything about code. I wish I did. I wish I learned. So we have Jimmy here to talk about those things. So I'm very excited, and I'm sure everyone at home is too. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, good to be here. Of course, Jimmy. Of course. So we're going to start out with just with, you know, some simple questions like what is your background as a developer? Like what experience do you have with that? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I started programming at a very young age. Right. So, I mean, uh, that was like my building blocks instead of Legos. I, I had code and uh, my parents were very tolerant of that. So learned, uh, you know, about, you know, what uh, made computers tick, learned a couple of different programming languages, actually. And um, really kind of started in the Napster peer-to-peer -peer space with okay. uh, working on a couple of projects that really had to do with file sharing. One of them was Nutella, which was actually one of the first um, hardcore peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, it was actually what powered LimeWire um, whenever it was in its, you know, at, at its height. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was into that stuff back in the day. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. And, and it was good, you know, and then, of course, you know, you get the cease and desist letters in the mail and you know, things like that. You know, they they uh, it, it was a really interesting project to be involved with, especially at the time was everyone was realizing the power of peer to peer. I don't want to turn on my fucking radio and have to put a nickel in it to hear Metallica. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it sort of sort of grew from there. From there, I, I leapt on to uh, contributing to the Kademlia project, which is the distributed hash table that powers BitTorrent. Okay. Um, so all of those, that's kind of working on that trackerless peer technology stuff. And, uh, and then from there, just sort of uh, got involved in operating systems, actually. So was working on um, operating systems for devices, um, you know, like, like either home appliances or casino gaming. Actually, it was, was also one that, uh, that I worked on for a while. Really? So it, that, was that a profitable area? Oh yes. oh yes oh yes <laughs> oh yes 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 we uh <laughs> it's that's like i mean practically stealing money right i yep. mean in terms of how that's set up but uh yeah it's, it's highly regulated though too so um you know it's each state is different depending on who uh you're selling to and what the laws are with regards to how your operating system has to be set up really and yeah yeah, so like you're you're not necessarily just writing one operating system you're kind of writing 50 for all the major jurisdictions and because and in each one of them has to audit things and it's yeah it was a nightmare um but it was it was it was a lot of fun though you know you, not many people get to work in that space and uh so ended up doing that and then yeah just sort of you know now present day kind of uh you know discovered the elastos project and kind of approaching it from a technical point of view and and really excited about what the elastos community is up to what the cyber republic is up to and and uh so i'm just sort of doing the same thing just on this project it's, okay. it's great so what languages are you most focused in well on a given day i use usually probably two to four different programming languages mm -hmm. um like all the operating system stuff is typically c plus plus um whereas whenever you're developing a web application most of it's you java. know javascript yeah java or javascript and uh so you know usually those are the the big ones that i stick to but i i know over a dozen different programming languages and they all have their they all have their different um strengths and weaknesses and once you learn one it's pretty easy to leapfrog on others mm -hmm. is it so it's kind of like similar like once you get one language you know you can start to figure out the concepts of mm -hmm. the other ones yep yeah yeah the, the high yeah, the high-level concepts are the same. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of like learning to form sentences, uh, you know, and, and word structures in one language is kind of the same in, in other languages, with the exception of the, you know, those other languages where it's read, like, you know, right to left <laughs> or something like that. But, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to leapfrog. Okay, that's pretty cool. So yeah. how about, um, you know, in the non-crypto world, what was your most challenging thing as being a developer? As being a developer, probably the uh, probably the embedded operating systems development. So, for example, you're developing a, an operating system that has to run a device that's on 24/7, um, and the you know depending on what type of device it is. For example, if it's a flight computer in an airplane, you have a lot of constraints. Um, so you have low memory. For example, you have to be able to decide what this computer is going to do when it has 250 passengers in the air yep. <laughs> and needs to like, and, and something happens to it. Like that's a very interesting problem to have. And it's something that they don't really teach you in school. Most times, most schools don't teach you about 
lower level computation, like when you learn how to program, they, that, that's kind of a black box. And sort of solving those problems in that type of environment where the, the vast majority of the general public is, is learning about things that are not necessarily what you're doing, was kind of a challenge, especially, again, like in that, you know, um, air, aircraft space, uh, in that embedded technology space, it's, it, they're very interesting problems that you have to solve, and they're very tough. Yeah, tough ones, yeah. I mean, you're dealing with people's lives. I mean, uh, yeah, at that point, yeah, and you have to decide, right? You're, you're like, okay, we can either go down and reset, or we can stay up and at the chance that like nothing bad happens, and you know everyone's going to make it from A to B safely. Now, of course, we mitigate that risk by it's not just one system. There's like five redundant backups of that system. So, so, so you, something yeah. like an aircraft, they're not going to be hooked up to the current form of the internet. No, they're not usually hooked up to the current form of the internet, and they're not running Windows, right? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're running a very specialized operating system, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, the different parameters altogether. So, how will they? I mean, if you think of the like IoT, you know, world, mm -hmm. everything would be connected to the Internet of Things, you know, devices, mm -hmm. airplanes, everything. So, is Elastos that time that we're going to have something built like that? Yeah, I, I do honestly think so. With the way that they're rolling out the carrier network designs, I, I believe that we are starting to develop very secure, you know, encrypted peer-to-peer -peer communications that are inherently reliable. Mm -hmm. And that's always been the problem in the peer-to-peer -peer space is the reliability of the connection. And, and Elastos is solving that in a, in a very elegant way. Yes, yes. So how did you first learn about Elastos? Oh, boy. I was doing uh, videos on the solid... Um, on the solid framework, or really the solid protocol that Tim Berners-Lee, who's the founder of the World Wide Web, right? He, he kind of came up with that concept of basically linked data years ago and said, well, let's apply it to, to basically data ownership. And I was looking at that from the perspective of decentralizing the internet and basically giving people the power to own their data again yep. and take it away from these big tech behemoths. And it was literally a YouTube comment on one of the videos that said, hey, cool video, but have you checked out what these Elastos guys are doing? That was about two months ago. And uh, that's whenever I, I kind of popped the hood on, on a couple of different things that Elastos was doing. And that's sort of how my videos got started was actually technical due diligence for myself before I either invest monetarily mm -hmm. or invest um, you know, with, with code and time and, and sort of doing what I'm doing now. And, and that's actually really, really how that started. It was just sort of off of the solid project. Well, you are in the perfect position, like, because you can do what I wish I could do. Like, I read, <laughs> I read the white papers, and that's where I sure. just got to have the faith in the developers, mm -hmm. you know. You're able to get into the stuff that I wish I could. So, very excited to talk to you. Well, well, it's fun to be able to call BS on some things, whether or not they're for or against Elastos. Now, most of them have been for Elastos. Um, you know, I mean, they're, sure, there are things that I noticed that, it, that I was like, eh, I'd, I'd kind of like it if, you know, it was different. But, yeah, it's, it's really given me a lens by which I can sort of tear everything apart and try to make the most informed decision that I can. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good situation to be in if you can. So what initially, like when you started learning about Elastos, what got you the most excited? Um, definitely the carrier piece, and that was that's bias actually. That's that's pure bias on my part. Um, I had I had worked um, and, and and sort of torn apart other cryptocurrencies before, namely Ethereum, because of the smart contract setup that they had with their VM. But really, what got me excited about Elastos was the carrier implementation and the fact that they were uh, tackling it from the operating system perspective. They they it wasn't going to be this. Hey, we're gonna just implement this on top of the current internet and we're going to trust that the big guys are doing what they're supposed to do. They're like, no, we're going to develop the tools to where you cannot have bad actors or, you know, it is, it is the odds are against having bad actors yeah. in terms of that ecosystem. And, and the blockchain is obviously a very powerful ingredient in one of that, but Elastos actually attracts me because it wasn't just a blockchain project. It was an ecosystem that's built around blockchain. Yes. Yes. So like, the carrier, you said it was built off of something. It was a fork of Tox. Could you That's explain correct. explain that a little deeper? What sure. is Tox? Sure, sure. So Tox, T-O-X, um, is effectively, it started as a Skype competitor. So people were very dissatisfied with the fact that Skype was a closed source thing. You didn't really know what it was doing. And of course, it was owned by one of the largest corporate entities that's ever existed, Microsoft. 
and they were worried about what was happening under the hood. And, and so they wanted to basically create something to where people could communicate securely. And what they did is they created this library or this, this toolkit that would allow peers on the internet to connect together uh, directly in sort of a mesh without a central server. That way um, that you could communicate reliably through firewalls and in different networking scenarios. And basically, Elastos Carrier builds on top of Tox and they, they, they enhanced it. They didn't actually just copy paste it. They said, okay, uh, this is an open source project. We're going to not reinvent the wheel because this does this whole peer to peer connection thing and this encryption piece really well. well yep. Yeah. So, so they effectively forked that and they're not, they're not shy about it. They, it's, it's mentioned in their documentation uh, as a special thank you that's in their credits and stuff. But, um, and they basically layered um, the, you know, the little carrier bits and pieces being able to, you know, send files, being able to establish, you know, um, direct sessions and stuff like that. They, they, Elastos enabled their own functionality on top of it, but it is based on Tox. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I was wondering more what Tox was. So yeah, thanks for explaining that. Quite welcome. So the carrier, so they're taking a unique approach, Elastos is. They're getting like the carrier on tech, like consumer devices, like the TV box. Explain mm -hmm. your thoughts on that. Do you think it's sure. a good approach? I do, honestly, I do, because um, there's, there's a couple of reasons why. One, a TV box, it's typically used in a residence where you have high-speed internet. You're not usually, you don't, you don't see TV boxes streaming over 56K dial-up modems. It doesn't happen. And they're always on, as a matter of fact. Like, like you, do, you usually don't turn the TV box off. You change your TV source to something else. Like, usually it's, it's still on in the background. So that solves the problem of availability. And, and, we, and we have the, the bandwidth pipe there to be able to support carrier traffic. Now, the other piece is one of the issues whenever you're having a peer-to-peer -peer network and you're trying to make it reliable is this problem of quote unquote bootstrapping. So making sure that there's always a node online to connect to. Yep. And, and the thing is, is the more peers that we have inside of this carrier network, the more traffic it can actually handle. Um, so it actually scales as it grows. Um, and, and that's a really important piece. And I think the TV box was a very important play for, a couple, for those reasons, as well as uh, it runs in the background. Mm -hmm. So the person doesn't even know they're running carrier. And I think that that's really where we need to get. We need to get blockchain out of the way of the consumer in the sense that the consumer doesn't really know that they're running blockchain. They're just consuming all of the wonderful inherent advantages that come with it. So devices, fridges, you know, TV uh, boxes, IoT. TVs. I mean, all of those are going to be running a carrier and people yep. aren't even going to know it. That's correct. Yes, that, and that's what's going to be powering, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer connections, files, and everything, correct? Right, and, and Carrier solves the problem of, again, the, the, the blockchain, you know, I said something the other day that the blockchain is not the meal. Blockchain is one ingredient in the entire meal, and this kind of accentuates that because what Ethereum tries to do is the blockchain is the compute engine. Yep. And, and uh, you know, Elastos takes the standpoint of, no, the blockchain is, is a trusted entity within this entire computed ecosystem where we need some ID. We need, we need something to be trusted and verifiable. But um, the compute should be offloaded, though, because the blockchain is very slow and very expensive uh, to, to run. So we can't have everybody dumping their trash into this blockchain. We, we need to kind of separate that. And yes. that's what Carrier does elegantly, and it does it a heck of a lot faster than you would have, you know, executing smart contracts on a VM on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. I mean, even pr proof of work, it's been shown to get clogged, Ethereum and Bitcoin, yep. even, you know, NEO, which has a delegated Byzantine fault tolerance, and yeah. it's shown to be able to get clogged. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. because of their consensus or they're getting spam, the free block issue. So, yeah. I mean, blockchain should not be used for that ingredient, you know, processing everything on the blockchain. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So explain the carrier you built. Uh, I mean, not the carrier, the crawler you built to check for the carrier nodes. Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, going back to the, to the earlier, being able to kind of call BS, right, when you see something, I was like, okay, I see a lot of hoopla about these TV set boxes and there's, there's doubt on one side and there's a heck of a lot of encouragement on the other. Let's see if we can kind of dispel one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so basically what I did is I took the carrier code and I modified it. And, and basically the carrier nodes, they're constantly communicating with other, with other nodes that, that basically saying, okay, 
who do you know? Who are you connected to? Okay, who are you connected to? And that's kind of how they discover each other to make uh, the network more reliable. Yep. So basically what I said is, okay, um, as soon as you get a list of those people that your neighbor knows about, like crawl them too, like go ask them who they know, and then just sort of like keep doing this all the way down. And what I effectively did is I cataloged all the results. So I'd be able to get the, the node's public key, the IP address, and various you know information about the node. And I let it run for about 24 hours. And it was wildly inefficient. I think I, sub I sampled a subset of about 22,000 nodes. And I think 21,600 of them were in China. Uh, was kind of was kind of the, the deal. So I was like, okay, that's that's pretty interesting. Um, why? Okay, like like what what else? Um, what other information can I get? So I took all the IP addresses and pretty much traced them all back to what their internet provider was. I wanted to eliminate all of the big cloud network people. I wanted to basically see are these individuals or are these companies? Yes. And and a lot of times you can tell that by you know basically who their you know their internet subscriptions are through or whatever. And uh, so. It looks like they've got a fairly decent geographic distribution in China, but the surprising thing was most of them were residences, and most of them were like their ADSL lines or whatever that are in China. And I'm like, okay, these are interesting. And what I would do is then I would basically talk to the same people that I'd found over and over and over again, and usually those same nodes were online. They they would stay online for long periods of time. Okay. And so that's how I that's how I was like, okay, so we've got a lot of these guys in China on residential connections. They're up for long periods of time. And I'm like, so this TV box thing must be real because yeah. these aren't, you know, hosted on some big cloud server. There, there were some that were hosted on cloud servers, and those are usually the bootstrap nodes that they want to be available all the time, time so yeah. that you always have someone to connect to. But yeah, I was like, okay, this is really not bad. And um, you know, it, which which made me laugh, of course, because in the last week's um, Elastos weekly update, they were like, hey, we just built a, a crawler that crawls the entire Tox network. I guess so. So I'm glad that they, they were like, okay, let's do that. Let's so, do it, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that just basically verifies that this P2P network is out there and it's starting yeah. to expand. Yeah, it, it's definitely growing. And, and so I, I still intend to revisit it and sort of optimize the code so that maybe I can actually get a sampling of the full network. Yep. And, um, and, and you know, again, and I would provide those results. But yeah, that one was a fun one to do. That was sort of my my intro to Carrier Project. And how long did it take you to build it? Uh, just a couple hours. Really, man. Yeah, awesome. a couple hours. It doesn't, take, it doesn't take long to do that sort of stuff. The Carrier, the carrier documentation is actually pretty good um, in terms of that. And for what the carrier documentation lacks, you, you can get from the talks documentation because it's based on a similar thing. So it's, um, it, it wasn't hard to get that stuff going and, and I've had experience doing similar things before. Awesome. So you just recently got to dig into the Elastos web wallet. So yes. could you walk us through a little bit of that? Oh boy, yeah. So it was kind of um, FUD central on, uh, on that web wallet discussion, right? It was a, it was a bad thing that uh, people were saying, this is locked away, it's closed source, and it's not real, it's a scam. And you, know, you, see, you see all that, that stuff come up, and I generally try to stay away from those. Um, but it, there was one day that it got particularly annoying, and I decided to just, okay, we're gonna rip apart the Elastis Web Wallet because I was curious about what made it tick. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, started looking at effectively what your browser was sending across the wire. You can kind of take a look at the HTML code and the JavaScript that's actually going across. Um, when you're using a wallet. And I noticed that there were multiple um, mentions of the word copay mm -hmm. inside of the code. And I was like, okay, this is a little interesting. And I Googled it and it turns out that copay is a, is a web wallet. It's an open source web wallet. And um, so I decided, okay, um, what is this doing um, underneath the hood? What sort of modifications has Elastos made? And they're, they're kind of merging the APIs for the web wallet and, of course, like the DID side chain. I can kind of see where this is going, where kind of the, you know, the, the process of generating these endorsed distributed IDs and holding a wallet, I can see that they're sort of marrying that technology. Eventually, it'll probably become completely transparent. It'll, it'll be a unified wallet experience. And I um, ended up uh, standing up a, an Elastos web wallet or, well, the Copay web wallet on my computer and uh, sort of tearing it apart. So I was like, okay, are there any malicious things happening? Like, like what is being sent across the wire when I 
receive some some you know LO. What is sent it being sent across the wire when I'm sending it to somebody? Making sure effectively that there are no bad actors here. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, it's it's vanilla copay wallet functionality. That's it's a direct fork. And again, totally legal. It's uh, they uh, they licensed it so that Elastos could come in and and they could sort of say, okay, well we will base our wallet on this, which actually I'm thankful about because that means that instead of one person or two people on the Elastos team keeping an eye on a wallet security, you've got an ecosystem of thousands of developers that are fighting for that same security. Because yeah, it's open source and it's been around for a long time. E exactly, exactly. And that's why, you know, the, this, the open source path that Elastos is taking, and I discussed this with Rong in a, at a pretty lengthy discussion, but it, you know, that's why the path of, of you know, utilizing open source and also being open source with the technology that Elastos creates itself is very important to the Elastos Foundation. Um, because we can have multiple eyeballs, just like me, you, whomever, that are basically looking through this code and, and making sure that everybody is, you know, behaving in the sandbox. Yes, yes. So you got to speak to Rong recently. I did. How was that? Yeah. Oh, well, it's freaking awesome. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he, 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 sit there, he blows you know, my it, mind talking to the guy. I mean... He, Right. And, and, you know, it was interesting the way that I got to, to talk to him or, or sort of how that came about, because I, again, going, going back through doing some technical due diligence, I wanted to know, okay, you've been working at this for 18 years. So either what you're doing is hilariously awful and nobody likes it, or like you've been through some, some iterations in the past. And I want to know basically where you've come from with this project. Mm -hmm. so, so I began to dig up research papers that Rong and his, uh, you know, his colleagues in college um, were actually working on that were related to Elastos. Really? And they, yeah, yeah. They go as far back, the, the earliest one I was able to find was 2003. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. I'd like so, to read those yeah. actually. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and I can uh, I can definitely send some links, and and they're all published in like you know ACM and, and the, the usual places where academic computer sciencey white papers get published. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really interesting, but you know it's it's amazing how common the name Rong Chen actually is. There's actually a no, ton of Rong Chen. Yeah. <laughs> so so narrowing it down was kind of uh, kind of a pain, but once I found um, where they had started working on this technology so long ago, I decided to. Um, take a, a, a deep dive in reading some of these papers. And I noticed that there was mention of a project called Elanix, so E-L-A-N-I-X. And so I just sent up uh, a tweet basically, and I said, you know, hey, Rong Chen, and uh, you know, mentioned the Elastos Foundation. I said, any chance that you got a copy of Elanix laying around somewhere, I'd like to mess around with it. And this was circa 2005 that that paper was written. So mm -hmm. I'm like, it's like, you know, 13 years old at this point. but. Um, I was like, I'd like to, to mess around with it and kind of see what you guys were working on. Because basically, that was where they had forked the Linux operating system, which is one of the most widely used operating systems on the internet, uh, or in terms of the, the, uh, the kernel, at least, the, the central piece of it. Mm -hmm. But, but um, effectively, I, I said, okay, what were you guys doing there? And they had actually implemented Elastos-type functionality inside of the main Linux kernel, which I was like, okay, you guys have tried this before. Why did it fail? Or why did you divert? And so basically that got through wrong. And within two days, Brad Laurie had set up, uh, you know, basically a WeChat group with, with wrong. And he said, Hey, um, wrong said, Hey, your questions are very technical. Let's do a call. And originally it was just going to be two engineers talking and the, the interview has no, no format, no structure. And because they didn't tell me they were going to record it. Oh, really? So I just, I, <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm just like, cool. We're going to we're gonna, we'll, we'll we'll get a video a call going. We're just going to chat. And then all of a sudden, yeah, I should have known that I was in for it when Kieran dropped in. And, and I was like, OK, you know, like, all right, it's it'll uh, it'll it'll be interesting. So it was basically me and wrong. And Kieran is basically just just sort of, you know, dropping into this conversation. And and it was great. You know, it was really great because one, it was refreshing for me to well, one, meet the, the man behind the vision. Right. Um, you know, it's, it, it's the horse's mouth there. But the other reason why it was great is it was refreshing to get another technical perspective. It's like, let's talk about this from an academic perspective, mm -hmm. because I, me and Rong have similar backgrounds in academia, at least. We both come from a, a computer science and research background, but um, we were just talking about the tech and I, I got a feel for his vision. Now, the one thing, of course, that really um, struck, struck me is the fact that this is his passion. He he said, he said, look, you know, my, my one dream whenever I was doing all of my 
you know, college research was to create my own operating system. And I still have not done that yet. Um, so he's like, this is like, and I've been doing this for 30 years, you know, been, been trying to do this for 30 years. And I said, okay, so it's, it's, it matters to you. And he's like, yeah, he's like the, the, the currency piece of it, like, doesn't matter to me at all is what he said. Yep. He's, he's like, you know, the, the valuation of Ella from day to day, like that, that's noise. Okay. In the, in the, in the, in, in the, the sense long of, scope of things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In the long term, he's like, that's noise. Um, he's like, but he, um, he's like, we're looking for more people. He's like, if, so if you know anyone, you know, get involved and, and here's where I see Elastos going. And, 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 you know, we were really able just to kind of sit down and have that chat about the tech and it was fantastic. Yep. It was very refreshing. And, um, you know, it, it actually solidified my confidence. Um, but you know, and, and I'm really a big fan of well, one wrong and the stuff that he's doing, but, um, sort of how he's leading the team, because he says though, that he doesn't code from day to day on the, on the, you know, on Elastos. He actually doesn't actually program. He hasn't programmed in a very, uh, long time. Uh, he mostly, um, lets the, the generals, you know, lead the war and, and stuff like that. And he'll just sort of, you know, say, here's what I think this should do. But he lets the open source community by and large kind of take that and run with it. And um, yeah, which is the the attribute of a of a true leader. He's he's empowering people to do good work. He's not dictating what that work should be. Yep. And he laid like the ground floor for everything. So the component yeah. assembly runtime. He's been working on that for a while. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The the, the component assembly runtime. That was an interesting thing, um, because Microsoft did something similar with .NET. So as a matter of fact, dot, .NET languages, there, there are several .NET languages. You have Visual C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic, just to name a couple of the .NET languages. So no matter what you actually write these languages in, or, or you know, w no matter which language you use, when you stamp this program down and package it up, it all runs the same stuff. It, all, it actually all gets translated to the same language underneath. Mm -hmm. And that's very similar to the component assembly runtime. Because the component assembly runtime basically says, all right, I want program A and B, even if they're written in, di in different uh, programming languages, I want them to be able to communicate seamlessly. Yes. And when you're building an, eco an ecosystem, you need to allow developers to use the tools that they're already familiar with. Yes. Which is one of the problems I had with Ethereum, is it's like, oh, now I got to learn this Solidity, Solidity language, right? Yeah, it's like, it's like now I got to learn this, this, this dialect of, you know, kind of looks like Java. Um, it was kind of like learning you know, Macromedia flex when you wanted to do flash programming. It was, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm only going to get use for this one application, this Ethereum VM and, and nothing else. And so you're hampering my creativity because now I'm trying to spend time learning the language in addition to like putting it on a blockchain. Yeah. And, and Elastos essentially removes that because they say, okay, if you develop things that can, you know, use this component assembly runtime, this, this little interface or this little, you know, this coat of paint on the outside, doesn't matter what you use behind the wall. Like that, that is up to you and you can communicate with almost anything else in our ecosystem provided that you both agree on um, that you're going to use the component assembly runtime to do it. And that's the important piece um, that, that in the Elastos um, ecosystem, at least in the Elastos design, is that a component assembly runtime, but basically it's a way to get multiple com programming languages to be able to communicate seamlessly without any you know, gobbledygook in between, it's pretty, you know, pretty direct. Yeah, so I think Wrong started working on that, you know, when mm -hmm. he was still at Microsoft, correct? He did, yes, yes. he did. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the component assembly runtime papers, I think even go back to about 2006, um, you know, just the, with the work that he was doing with component assembly runtime. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about Ethereum. So Elastos is actually creating a smart contract sidechain, which can process Ethereum smart contracts. What do you mm -hmm. think of this? Do you think it's a good idea? I think it's a brilliant idea because, um, again, allowing people to, to use the Elastos ecosystem with the tools they're already familiar with. We've already got a bunch of people that have vouched for Ethereum's VM, despite any limitations that it might have. Um, there's still a resource pool out there. There's still talent out there that knows this stuff, and there's still a, a use for it. So I think having Ethereum sidechain support will ultimately benefit the Elastos um, ecosystem. One, because we'll have the node density. Um, you know, if, if all of those Ethereum VM nodes are also running carrier bootstraps, we gain a oh, lot wow. of, we gain all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we need to capitalize on that because again, Elastos is building an ecosystem. So we need people to adopt the technology. So, you know, 
whether or not it's the Ethereum VM or whether or not it's, you know, programming language, like, you know, I don't know if CryptoKitties had a programming language, it's like, we should support that yes. if we can, if because we, can. we want, we want the, the CryptoKitties developers that are in their mom's basements to use Elastos. We don't want to cut anyone out. Right. Exactly. So uh, it's a fantastic thing. Yeah. I, I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, this will lower our cost of ownership because we'll have access to all of these wide arrays of technologies in order to run the Elastos ecosystem. We're, we're not forcing companies to re-implement their technology uh, completely, yeah. uh, which is fantastic because we need enterprise adoption. We need businesses to adopt the technology and, and we're ultimately breaking those barriers down. So from my understanding, actually Kieran, he, he cleared this up for me. There's gonna yeah. be a smart contract side chain. And then there's gonna be an ID side chain. For each D app, you know, they're gonna be using different side chains. And that's where mm -hmm. the distributed computer comes from, you know? Correct. And that blew my mind. When Kieran finally explained that to me, I was like, whoa, okay, now I see. We're not doing everything on one blockchain, you know? We're scaling yeah. through side chains. Yeah. And that's that that's the important piece, right? Because you know, you look at Bitcoin and you know, Bitcoin, what what does it have going for it in terms of computation? It's well, for the most part, the buying and selling of Bitcoin, right? It's it that that's that's it, right? And and um, you know, so therefore everything that happens with Bitcoin gets thrown into the same ledger. And you've got the total cost of ownership rising exponentially depending on, you know, if company A decides to, you know, dump a bunch of stuff into the blockchain, you know, and then, you know, company B only needs like it for like one piece, everybody kind of like bears that total cost of ownership, no matter what part of the bit, no matter what part of the Bitcoin ecosystem you're using. Mm -hmm. Whereas Elastos, you can kind of do it piecemeal. So if your program doesn't need the ID sidechain, which I can't imagine why you wouldn't, but you know, if you didn't need the ID sidechain, okay, that's I'll fine. You could, yeah, you can just stay. Out, you can stay on the main chain or the token side chains, depending on what your implementation should be. And you, and you know, you can kind of control that co that cost of ownership um, with how much data you're having to consume. So I think that it's fantastic um, because guess what? We'll only settle final transactions on the main chain. We'll sort of you know abbreviate this whole thing so that um, you know ultimately. Um, you kind of pick and choose what you what you want, and and I think that's a fantastic idea. Yep, and even Satoshi, he talked um, about side chains as a way to scale. He he actually talked about side chains in the terms of merged mining. Mm -hmm. So the other side chain implementations, um, it's a two way peg. That's yeah. how they do it. And mm -hmm. with what Wrong is doing, he's doing merged mining more in Satoshi's mm -hmm. vision. So mm -hmm. actually, I made a video that said Rong Chen might be Satoshi. <laughs> what do you think yeah. of that? <laughs> you know, I, I think you know, I think that uh, it's a, it's definitely a brilliant mind, right? I, I know that um, people were trying to figure out who Satoshi was, and I think they determined that he could live somewhere in Alabama, right? Based on the times of day that Satoshi was posting, and sort of like the the habits of when the code was committed to the repository they kind of he must be an eastern time you know and i'm like well wrong has come to the united states you know and, and been here for extended periods of time mm -hmm. um you know and uh, and you know wrong is certainly not dumb right i mean he is one of the you know one of the smartest people i've ever had the privilege of speaking me too to. it's amazing and, like, right I'm you know I mean, right like i'm like well I'm the dumbest person in the room right now, you know, <laughs> yep. so they're talking to him. And, um, you know, but uh, the, the interesting piece is that, uh, you know, Satoshi is, is much the same. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but then again, you also have to figure, well, if wrong is Satoshi, I don't expect him to come out and say that for obvious reasons, right? Of you know, course. you have multiple people painting a target on your head. Um, you know, so I, <laughs> I'm okay. You know, if, if, if wrong Chen, is Satoshi? I'll sleep very well. At night. Me too. And I mean, <laughs> this would be the perfect way if Satoshi wanted to come out public again. You know, with because in one of his last emails too, he said he's moving on to bigger and better things. That's true. So That's true. the only way he could do it is to just come out. You know, hide in plain sight. <laughs> right. You know, he, if he tried to do it all secretive, they would be able to find him so quick. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Absolutely. So and this is only. I I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> we, have, so, we have cracked this case we have cracked the case <laughs> so um what are you most excited about for the future of Lastos? like what do you see happening in the future in the next six months a year down the road 
so I see Elastos making great inroads in the IoT space. And of course, obviously, everyone knows about the partnership with IOEX. But um, you know, I see Elastos as the fundamental technology behind that. Mm -hmm. And these, the reason why I think this is such a big deal is because the IoT space will be what ultimately probably brings blockchain to consumers. Um, because it, again, it, they, they have four buttons on the outside of whatever this device is, but it's all powered by blockchain. And when you have company X that makes an Elastos powered IOT device and company Y that makes proprietary cloud-based IOT thing, and then company Y gets nailed because billions of subscribers information get leaked because it's hosted on a cloud system somewhere, or uh, guess what? China is no longer online because billions of these IoT devices have been hacked in order to DDoS China off the face of the earth. Well, this vendor, this Elastos powered vendor is going to gain popularity pretty quickly. And the current trend of the internet has shown us that it's not that if it'll happen, it's when. It's when, and, exactly. And it's only a matter of time, right? Because you have, you know, Equifax, you know, the, the one of the most highly guarded entities that, you know, is making stupid decisions, like leaving Java web services just exposed anywhere to where anyone can get them. It's only a matter of time. Yeah, yeah. It's going to happen. And, Another yeah. big one's coming. Yes. And, and so, you know, you know, if you've got billions, billions of these IoT devices that are going to flood the Internet, that's a very large attack surface area. And if you tell somebody that, hey, in my house, all of my webcams, all of my door locks that are, you know, now smart, um, you know, have some form of intelligence behind them. Um, you know, now they're all of a sudden just hanging out there on some private cloud that's so or some public cloud that somebody has gained access to. That's a very chilling effect. And then whenever you say, hey, this other system exists over here um, that, you know, is almost impossible. Your, your devices don't communicate with some cloud somewhere. They're communicating with the device that's in the other room. You, you own all of this communication. That communication is direct from your wall security panel to your door lock. You're not having to worry about this, uh, this other piece where it's got to go out and come back and, and uh, you're trusting that Samsung's going to update things, you know, and, and keep you safe. You're, it's like, no, now you, um, you know, you're, you own that. And we think that uh, that's really where this will, will drive uh, things up, especially in the, um, the enterprise like manufacturing spaces where they cannot afford downtime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't afford to be offline for minutes. And, and so you need things that are resilient, that are robust, because a peer to peer network doesn't go offline. Yep. And, exactly. uh, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing. And I think that's where we're going to see a lot of adoption. And these enterprises, unlike consumers, are not price sensitive. Mm -hmm. So they're willing to pay um, companies, which is going to attract further money or, you know, further dollars into the Elastos ecosystem. And it's going to make the demand for Elastos developers at an all time high, which will, attract more developers to the, you know, to the ecosystem. So it just sort of flir flourishes from there. Yeah, it's going to be a snowball effect. I have a feeling we're going to yeah. see a paradigm shift. You know, yeah. we're going to have these smart homes, you know, five years down the road, and there's going to be some companies that go the angle of Elastos, yeah. some go mm -hmm. the old way. And we're going to have, so. we're going to see some of those big houses be attacked. And that's when the big paradigm shift is going to switch to Elastos. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that um, you know there's a there's a huge shift right now in terms of democratizing various services on the internet, right? I mean, Solid gained a lot of uh, publicity, yes, because of Tim Berners Lee, but but really also because of the problem they're trying to solve, and you know, as a result of Cambridge Analytica and, and you know everybody's data is for sale, um, they're trying to solve a problem from that light, and the public is gaining awareness of this issue, mm -hmm. and ultimately, Elastos will benefit from that because we're taking it. To, to again saying that it, it's there's no longer trust that there's going to be no bad actors it's like okay the odds are completely in your favor that you will have control over your data because the network by design makes sure that you have to explicitly share this data with people and they can't go around the back and get it they can't cache that data or anything like that it's it's a fantastic implementation that's sort of uh making people um you know aware of this problem and the solutions that are out there yeah so non-developer question, really. What do you think of the Cyber Republic, that concept? Um, they are desperately needed. Um, you know, developers were, were terrible marketers. Uh, and, and the Cyber Republic is really taking the approach of getting the word out there. They're, they're developer evangelists, if you will. They are marketer evangelists. They're, they're really trying to, to get the word of Elastis out there. And they're trying to incentivize people 
for climbing on board and putting in some of their time. So I think that they're really, 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 um, you know, a necessity in this ecosystem because you see a lot of these other crypto projects that come out that really don't have a big push. They're like, the product is the coin. Yes. Okay. The, the product is, oh, you buy into this and it's going to 10x. And it's the only thing that we have to offer is, um, you know, a speculative audience. And the Cyber Republic goes about it and says, yeah, okay. A, 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 a cryptocurrency is a necessity here to incentivize people to participate in our ecosystem and to donate resources in our ecosystem. But here are all of the business use cases. Here are all of the use cases for this technology. Here is what we're doing. We're going to organize a meetup in your town. So if you want to learn more about Elastos, come to a meetup here join. in Singapore. Yep. Yeah, come on in. And, and that is really and truly a necessity. And we saw this back in the day with Microsoft when they came out with you know, some new developer technology. For example, they had all these developer evangelists doing the exact same thing that Cyber Republic was doing. Of like, hey, you know, you think that Java stuff's trash? Come over here and try this .NET stuff. You know, and and you know, Cyber Republic's doing the same thing for developers, marketers, bloggers. Um, you know, we've got uh, video you know, the, production. You know, and, right, and, hey, here we are, right? Yeah. yeah, right. We're all paid by the right. cyber. No, but uh, no, but but we, you know, we. Um, like it's, it's attracting a lot of new talent. Like for example, the market angels, uh, you know, Christian, you know, doing those videos over there. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of incentive for people to get involved and, and I think it's a fantastic thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just saw that market angel video. It was excellent. And I'm yeah. so, so glad more people are starting to realize that mm -hmm. this is happening and the snowball is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and we've got more stuff planned, by the way, like through that channel. So and, and all of that's being facilitated by the Cyber Republic. It's, nice. it's good. That's yeah. awesome. So my final question for you um, is regarding Fang Han. Have you ever had a pleasure to um, speak to him, the other co-founder? I have not. I have not. You know, and, and of course, I'm a big fan of, you know, the, the work that all the people on the Elastos team have, have been doing, mm -hmm. and, and he is definitely somebody that I would love to speak to. Have, yes. you, have you actually been able to speak to him? Yeah, I got to interview him once in, yeah. be in Beijing. They flew me over there a long yeah. time ago to go to the G3 conference. Awesome. Yeah, so I got to see uh, Ji Han Wu, Feng Han, um, yeah. and I got to interview him. He doesn't, oh, he does speak a little English, but it's not his first language. Sure. So it was a little bit of a communication barrier, but it was definitely awesome to chat to him, because he's yeah. like, He's like the, um, you know, Steve Jobs and, you know, <laughs> Rong Chen is the Wozniak, you know? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and I think that, uh, you know, you need both sides of that coin. Right. Um, and, and that's one thing that has historically before, you know, Fang Han and before the Cyber Republic has sort of crippled the last dose. It was always seen as this academic project you know, that will never see the light of day. And now, you know, they're bringing it out to the masses, you know, like it's, you know, Feng Han is negotiating these deals with Taiwanese, you know, device manufacturers. Like, you know, th there's a large execution side of this that, that Feng Han is just hitting out of the park, yep. you know, and, and, and seriously, and absolutely. Runs. absolutely. Donated 5 million to make MIT's blockchain research wing. Like, absolutely. Like, yeah. That, that to me is showing exactly what's going to happen to Elastos. One of the biggest tech schools, you know, where creating their blockchain wing. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at um, the core DHT, which, um, again, is this is the same type of design that, you know, Bitcoin uses, all that stuff came out of MIT as well. So they're familiar with the space like they are very capable of working out these problems. And by getting MIT and really the the Sloan School of Business and their blockchain initiatives involved, we've got a lot of great minds thinking about this from not just the technology side, but the business side as well, oh, well. which is where these deals are going to be forged. Absolutely. Yeah. So actually, now here's my last question. So okay. there's a bunch of rumors going around about the Manhattan Project. Something about an index fund is going to come for Elastos D apps. Have you heard anything about that? Um, only based on what I've seen online. So yeah. I have not gotten any like insider privy information of, you know, this is zero day here. The, the day of the internet's going to just be completely revitalized because we've got millions of dollars flowing in the DF funds. It's, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a, it's a good thing though. Right. You know what I mean? So, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts on the Manhattan project? Let's, let's, let, we can dig into that for a second. Yeah. Well, my thoughts personally, I'm super excited. Like this is yeah. where Fang is excelling. He's creating these deals, so he's talking to someone because mm -hmm. he's the one that 
coined it Manhattan Project. Right. So there's something going on in New York, you know, what's over in New York, Wall Street. Like, I think he's trying to cut some deals to get an index fund traded over there. That's my, my personal opinion of what it is. Absolutely, because, you know, the moment that you get an index fund created and you get uh, things like that that are sponsored by, you know, you know, state regulatory boards and things like that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing the due diligence to do this right, right? You're putting in the time to, to set the framework up so that these deals can actually take, take place and you're, legit, you're legitimizing the whole thing through the formation of these index funds that are geared towards, you know, galvanizing excitement toward the Elastos project. Yep. I think that's, that is a supreme play. Yes. Because it, it's going to attract business talent. It's going to attract tech talent. It's going to attract money. It's going to attract all of the things that the Elastos community is going to need in order to survive. Again, not as a crypto project, but as an ecosystem. Yeah. And that requires uh, not just not just money, right? It requires a lot of people. It requires a lot of press coverage. And so, absolutely. So now it no longer becomes this rogue Chinese project that you know this cyber republic, you know, whomever they are is working on. Now it's like no, like we are. A, a reputable um, endeavor here. We have taken the time to do things right. We've taken the time to force these deals with, you know, New York City-based agencies. These, you know, these Western, you know, securities. You know, the SEC. We're making sure that everything is vetted. And um, I think that uh, you know, well played, right? Well played because that's always been one of the major things that people were wondering about. Not necessarily just the last us, but the the crypto space. And you know, like, when are we going to see some legitimate uses? And, um, you know, so I, I think that um, it's, it's going to really open up a lot of potential. Oh, yeah, I agree 100 percent, Jimmy. Like having the reputable companies, New York, something's going on there. Mm -hmm. We have MIT. Um, it's giving Alaska that name. You know, like you said, it's not just a Chinese project anymore. It's we're taking over the West, it looks like. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited for the future. Um, any last words you got to say? Um, any future plans for you, Cyber Republic? Sure. Yeah, I'm working on uh, working on a couple of different videos. Um, working on with with the Cyber Republic, actually. So uh, we're we're gonna right now. We're sort of on this this Trinity kick, right? We're we're working on these uh, the D apps and sort of getting people um, involved or getting the technology to a standpoint where people can get involved in writing D apps. So you're gonna see a lot of technology or a lot of uh, press coverage over Trinity um, and sort of writing D apps for the Elastos ecosystem. And then the next chapter, I'm already working on that. So they've got me kind of like one iteration ahead. So the next push is gonna be with Carrier. And uh, the timing on that is not coincidental with, uh, with um, you know, IoT, you know, uh, with that IoT push, we're going to be working on rolling out carrier again, even more to the masses through device distribution deals and things like that. Um, so I will be doing some some coverage there for the Cyber Republic. Um, Marketing Angel um, potentially, you know, could be doing some some more uh, blockchain uh, or really Elastos based breakdown. So we're working on all that good stuff, and uh, ultimately it's going to be an exciting time for Elastos mm -hmm. uh, because you're going to see a lot more um, a lot more ideas come to light. For yeah. Sure. Yeah, actually, I'm dropping, to, is it tomorrow? Yeah, so our video will be posted in two days on Wait. Tuesday. Um, tomorrow, I'm dropping my best The Last of Us video I've created. It's Really? Oh, it's, yeah. it's your masterpiece? It's, 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 a, it's a masterpiece, let me tell you. Sistine Chapel, yeah, right? So. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> that one's dropping tomorrow, so I'm super excited to get that out. Perfect. Yeah, that that's gonna be fantastic. So I'll be watching it. You know, I'll have it. Uh, I'll have it on loop while I'm working. And uh, you know, again, hey, thanks for the stuff you're doing. You know, I mean, it's it's been fantastic to watch uh, your coverage of not just Elastos, but really the entire space. It's it's fantastic. Thank so, you. you know, I appreciate that. Well, yeah. when when I first met Elastos, um, I'm like one of the first guys to talk about Elastos. It was last yeah. year, and yeah. I just heard about him because I was into Neo, and it was another Chinese project. And they're at a conference, actually, um, North American Blockchain Expo. Right. And it was Fang and another um, guy, I can't remember his name. And I was like, Elastos? And then they look, yeah. turn, because like, no one knew of him. <laughs> and they turn and look at me, and I'm like, are you guys Elastos? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, hug me. And we hugged each <laughs> other like in the middle. And then I gave like my first interview with um, their core developer back then. So it was good. Yeah. Yeah, they are just, uh, and that's one thing that I can say about Elastos, um, the Cyber Republic is they are a very good group of people. They're a very genuine group. And, you know, they know of the, the battles that they have to face, you know, I mean, in terms of rolling this technology out. And they're really, um, you know, transparent about what they're up to in terms of like, here's where we'd like to go. 
And, uh, you know, they're a very, very awesome group to work with. So no, no doubt that, uh, you know, people, you know, want to just reach out, want to get involved and, and, you know, similar to yourself, whenever you saw them for the first time, it's, it, that's the effect that I had. I'm like, oh my gosh, how can I not get involved? Yeah. I, that's how I felt. Like they want, yeah. came up and just hugged me. Like I never met him before in my life. And Fang, <laughs> Fang just gave me a big old hug. I was like, all right, I know I'm going to like these guys. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for coming on the channel. It's been excellent. Um, this is good, very valuable stuff for the community. Cool. Talking, getting you a developer's eyes on things. So appreciate you, man. Yeah, man. I really appreciate what you're doing. Thanks for having me on, Tyler. It's no been fun. No problem.